Um, so I'm just going to go over step by step the genetic testing process here at New Hope. So this just goes over the overall timeline of what to expect during the course of an IVF treatment. Most patients undergo about two weeks of monitoring, which you begin on day three of your cycle, which is basically bl blood work and the sonogram. And from there, we start to give you medications to stimulate the ovaries. And then we pinpoint a time that we're going to do the egg retrieval. So the day of egg retrieval is considered day zero. So that's the day that we do the insemination of the eggs that we retrieve. And then the following morning, we do a fertilization assessment. So that's considered day one. Day two, we no longer check embryos here at New Hope. Basically, we're trying to minimize the disruption as much as humanly possible. So we no longer check embryos, but we do expect them to be between two and four cells to be considered normal. Day three, we take the embryos out of the incubator to check them to make sure they're between six and eight cells, and we start the process of assisted hatching, which is basically in preparation for the biopsy process. In order to do the biopsy, we have to do hatching. There's no way around that. Day four, again, we don't check the embryos just because we're trying to minimize the disruption of them being out of the incubator. And we have a three-day window here at New Hope for blastocyst formation, day five, day six, day seven. So as the embryos advance to the blastocyst stage, we do the biopsy, and then we subsequently freeze the embryos for your future use. Basically, at the completion of the cycle, we then would give you an update that will go over the information as far as how many blastocysts have been biopsied and frozen, their stages, their grades, and then we ask you to give us confirmation to send the samples out for genetic testing. Without your consent, all these samples remain here at our center. All it requires is a simple email back to us stating, yes, please send. We then have the billing department reach out to you to confirm payment, and then we'll send them out for you after that. Depending on the laboratory that we use, the results actually, the turnaround time is quite quick, roughly about five days. Once we have the results, we will relay all that information back to you. So on the day of egg retrieval, what we're looking for is the big black follicles on the screen. Basically from there, we have to aspirate the fluid. And in that fluid, what we're expecting to find is an oocyte. Basically an egg is surrounded by something called cumulus cells. So these are the cells that support the egg, give them the nutrients that they need, and to continue to advance them in hopes of maturation. If we're doing something called ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, it requires us to clean up the egg so we can visualize if it's mature or not. When you have all these cells surrounding it, it's not possible to uh, do an assessment of the maturation. So it requires us to clean up the egg, visualize if it's mature, and then we would proceed with insemination. If we're trying to do a more natural approach or the conventional insemination method, where we're simply taking sperm and in, uh, putting them right next to the egg, we do leave some of these cells intact to simulate a more natural fertilization method. Most of our patients here we do use ICSI for, just due to advanced maternal age, failed at fertilization in the past, and it's always at the embryologist's discretion. If patients have special requests, we do try to obviously accommodate that as much as possible if you have a preference. So if we are doing ICSI, we do a, an assessment to make sure the egg is mature. The bottom one is M2, or mature. Basically, that means that the egg has something called a polar body. That means that this egg is ready to accept a sperm. There are two different types of immature egg. Uh, M1, which basically there's no polar body body visible, and then germinal vesicle, which basically looks like it has a circle with a dot in the center. This is the most immature egg in both situations of M1 or germinal vesicle. We do try to do something called in vitro maturation, where we hold these eggs in culture in our incubator in hopes that they'll mature overnight. I will say that they do have slightly less of a likelihood of making a blastocyst embryo, but we want to give our patients as many options as possible. So we definitely, if they mature overnight, we'll do the insemination the following morning. And we go from there. On the day of egg retrieval, again, we have two different types of insemination that we do here at New Hope. Most commonly are, is ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So this means we physically pick up a sperm cell and inject it directly into the egg. Conventional insemination is basically a more natural approach where we just basically take a sperm specimen and put it next to the egg in hopes that it will naturally fertilize. 
again, most of our patients, we do use ICSI-4, not only because they request it, but because they've had f failed fertilization in the past. So as far as sperm processing, we have patients that use fresh sperm, they use frozen. Basically, no matter what, we do have to process it um, in order to make sure we have high quality motile sperm, and that's what we'll use for the actual insemination process. You can use donor sperm. Unfortunately, we don't have that here at our office. You have to order it from an outside facility. It gets shipped to us, and then we can do something called a partial thaw, meaning you can use it over the course of four IVF cycles. So it can save you a little bit of money just because donor sperm is quite expensive. So we do try to save patients a little bit of money by trying to use it over the course of several cycles. If you have a par your partner is coming in and he's freezing his specimen for the future, most of the time it requires us to use one vial of sperm per egg retrieval just because their sperm tends to be of you know, lesser quality just due to age or other factors. So most of the time we do have to thaw the entire thing. If you have a special request to try to partial thaw it so we can use it over the course of several cycles, we will try to do that for you, but it's not always possible for us in the laboratory. It is something else that we do offer here is a MESA or a TESA. So this is if your partner doesn't produce any specimen in his ejaculate. We can refer you to a urologist and he would help you set up this procedure. It's basically a biopsy procedure and then we try to get sperm from that specimen. Definitely a little bit difficult, more difficult of a procedure and we, it requires us to use ICSI. Any form of sp frozen sperm we use ICSI for automatically because we do not want to thaw your specimen without knowing that the egg is mature. We don't want to waste anything. So on day one, we do a, something called a fertilization ex assessment. So what we're hoping for is two PN or two pronuclei. One pronuclei comes from the mom and one pronuclei comes from the dad. There are situations where we have pending fertilization, meaning that we cannot confirm that fertilization has taken place within this egg, meaning some chemical reaction looks like it's occurring, but unfortunately we're not seeing the typical signs of 2PN. So that's 1PN, which basically is one polar body is present. It could mean that the other one has already disappeared or the other one hasn't appeared yet. 2PB means there's two polar bodies or PB, only one polar body. So any of these situations, we do keep the eggs in culture for you. We're not going to just dispose of them. We'll keep them for a couple days to see if they'll start to undergo cellular division because that's what we're hoping for. In situations where we have uh, too much genetic information or 3PN or above, these we have to automatically discard. There's too much genetic information present within the egg, so we can't use this. It's not viable. It's not going to lead to a successful pregnancy. So it's our policy automatically that these are disposed of. As far as insemination on day one, say um, we do the more natural insemination approach and unfortunately it fails, we do try to do something called rescue ICSI. This is at the discretion of the embryologist, so they're the ones that make this determination if they feel that you would benefit from this. Day one ICSI is for any of those eggs that unfortunately on the day of egg retrieval were immature, but we were able to mature overnight in our laboratory. We'll pick up a sperm and inject it directly into the egg the following day and then we'll check it the next morning to see if it has fertilized normally or not. So um, this is just a copy of our grading system for cleaving embryos. So this is in the earlier stages of development. So we grade on an A3D scale, A being the best, meaning picture perfect, no fragmentation, evenness of the cells. We typically don't give A gradings here. We are very, very strict graders, so it's not typical to get an A grade. Maybe one or two times a year we give a grade A. For most of our patients, we're giving a grade B. Um, that's because most embryos do have a slight unevenness in their cellular division, meaning one cell may be larger than the other. Not a problem at all. And typically embryos do have some degree of fragmentation, so little pieces of cells that kind of break off. Completely normal, nothing to be uh, concer overly concerned about. A grade C just means there's more unevenness in the cellular division, there's a higher degree of fragmentation. Again, this embryo is still viable, so obviously we keep it in culture, continue to watch it, hopefully it will continue to grow and develop. Unfortunately, grade D basically means the embryo is degenerating. So at this point, the embryo is not viable. We do automatically discard a grade D embryo. It's just our policy. On day two, which I already explained, we do not check embryos on day two. We're expecting them to be between two to four cells. That's considered normal. On day three, uh, embryos should be between six and eight cells to be considered normal development. Again, on day three, we do something called assisted hatching in preparation for the biopsy process that'll occur later. So on day one and day three, we do change our embryos over into new dishes, basically to give them the culture media that they need to continue to grow and develop. This just supplements their needs because embryos are growing things, they do create waste, so we have to supplement that by changing their media to give them uh, everything they need to continue to grow and survive in our laboratory. 
Um, as I've already mentioned, we do not check embryos on certain days here, particularly day two and day four, just because we do not want to keep the embryos coming in and out of the incubator. It's not good for them. Temperature change, pH change, we're trying to avoid uh, as much disruption as possible to give the embryos the best chance that they can to grow, develop, and hopefully become blastocyst embryos. Again, if we're doing the testing, we do assisted hatching, which we'll have a video a little later in the presentation that will show you exactly how that process takes place. So on day four, we again don't check the embryos, but when we did, these are the stages that we expected. Compacting, marular, or cavitating. Um, most commonly we saw compacting here for most of our patients. It just means that some of the cells are just starting to merge together. Marula basically is a solid mass of cells, typically between 16 and 32 cells. Uh, the embryo starts to do this process. And cavitating is the stage right before blastocyst formation, where we're starting to get the fluid-filled pockets of a blastocyst embryo. So blastocyst grading, we uh, do grade a little differently here than most centers. We use a three numerical scale for our grading system. The first number is for the overall advancement of this particular blastocyst embryo, graded on a one being the most early, and then six being the most advanced. So when we're doing a biopsy, we tend to only biopsy embryos that are more advanced within the blastocyst stage because we want to be able to clearly distinguish the inner cell mass, which is what becomes the baby, from the trifectoderm cells, which is what becomes the placenta. So in the earlier stages of development, you cannot differentiate the cells. They all look the same. So we have to verify that we can clearly distinguish the inner cell mass from the trifectoderm before we will proceed with biopsy. If the embryo is not advanced enough, we'll keep watching it throughout the day to pinpoint the correct time to do the biopsy process and then subsequently freeze. So the inner cell mass, we grade on a one through three scale, one being like an A, two being like a B, three being like the, a C. Same thing for the trifectoderm. Again, very strict grading here at New Hope. We give mostly twos and threes, so Bs and Cs, completely fine. The grade that we give a blastocyst is just the way it looks, so it's morphology. It doesn't tell you anything about the genetic makeup. You could have a beautiful embryo and it'd be abnormal, or a not so good embryo and it'd be normal. So I always tell patients, don't put too, too much weight on the grading because that's one piece of the puzzle. Once we have the genetic testing results back, we can kind of match everything up and tell you which one would be number one, number two, number three, if we have that option. So this is what a blastocyst actually looks like in the laboratory. The inner cell mass is the clump, clump of cells that's on the kind of the top um, position, and then all the other cells are the trifectoderm cells. So um, we do offer two different types of transfers here. Um, unfortunately, if we're doing um, PGS testing, we do require frozen embryo transfer. Just because of the type of testing we're doing, it does require you know, more time in order to get the results back to do a transfer, so it's not possible to do it within the same cycle. And it's actually more beneficial for most patients to use a frozen embryo transfer anyway, because then you're not on all these medications that can potentially thin your lining. So when you're doing egg retrieval, some of the medications can thin the lining. So obviously we want to avoid that because we're trying to get you pregnant. So most of our patients are doing frozen embryo transfers with PGS. Um, we're not doing very many fresh transfers here at New Hope anymore. We do strictly vitrification here. So that's a fast freezing method. We can freeze eggs, uh, so for fertility preservation, but they must be mature eggs. Embryos, uh, day three, have to be between six or eight cells for us to consider them viable to be subsequently frozen. And blastocysts, again, three day window, day five, day six, day seven. So as the embryos advance, we do the biopsy process and then freeze them. There's two different types of genetic testing that patients can do. For almost every single one of our patients, we're doing pre-implantation genetic screening, or PGS. And the particular type of PGS that's the most advanced that we're offering to our patients now is NGS, or next generation sequencing. Uh, so that's the best technology that's out there presently. So it screens embryos for something called aneuploidy, or the abnormal number of chromosomes. So whether it's too much information, like tr uh, trisomy or Down syndrome, trisomy 21, or missing information, so a monosomy. A pretty common one that I see is Turner syndrome, when you only have one copy of the X chromosome. NGS also has the capabilities of detecting mosaicism. So some cells that we remove from the embryo may be normal, whereas some may be abnormal. In very rare incidences, depending on the chromosomal abnormality, the doctor may recommend a mosaic embryo for transfer because we do have patients that have live birth, but it depends on the chromosome that's affected. NGS can also detect translocations. We don't have very many patients that have translocations. I see maybe one or two cases a year, so it's not very common. 
ACGH or Array Comparative Genomic Hybridization is the old technology. So we no longer offer that to our patients because why would we use an old technology when we have something newer and better that is capable of picking up more abnormalities uh, for you. Um, PGD done a lot less commonly here at New Hope or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is when you're screening an embryo for a particular disorder that you and your partner carry. So, you know, I've seen several cases of sickle cell anemia, fragile X, Tay sacs cystic fibrosis. So these are things that we screen you for certain uh, abnormalities. Should you be a carrier, we automatically screen your partner. Should your partner be a carrier, we would then screen the embryos for this particular abnormality as well as do NGS testing. So we do both at the same time. As far as the fee difference is, it's significant. PGD cases tend to cost significantly more than NGS testing um, just due to the the methods in which they have to create a special probe to test the embryos for this particular disorder. It's not very common for a patient and partner to be a carrier of the same disorder, but obviously that's why we test you for things. If there's an issue, then we would alert you immediately. So why do patients do NGS testing? Most of our patients are over the age of 35, so given that alone, we do recommend patients to really consider NGS as a viable option because we want to reduce the amount of cycles you have to undergo reduce the risk of miscarriage, um, and decrease the number of cycles and frozen embryo transfers you have to do in the future. With the, the testing, the risk of miscarriage is around 7 to 10 percent, so it greatly reduces the risk of miscarriage. So that's why we do this for almost all of our patients, just because we don't want to put you through unnecessary um, miscarriages or transfers. So now I'm going to go over the process uh, that we do upstairs in the lab as far as the NGS process step by step. So there's two different types of biopsy that can be done, a day three embryo biopsy or a blastocyst trophectoderm biopsy. Um, day three biopsy we no longer do um, just because uh, we found that it's just not a really good option anymore. Since the technology has advanced, it's definitely better to do the blastocyst or trophectoderm biopsy. Um, day three, the embryo is only six to eight cells, so when you do a biopsy, you only can remove one cell. If you were to remove any more than that, we would do more harm to the embryo than good. So we have to, when we did that process, it's definitely risky to the embryo. We'd never, we didn't really see that much growth the next day, and there's a high risk of mosaicism, meaning that cell that we removed maybe is the only normal or abnormal cell in the embryo. So we stopped doing that process entirely. So strictly, we do blast cyst or trophectoderm biopsy, where this allows us to remove more cells from the embryo because it's over 100 cells. So depending on the embryo itself, sometimes we take three cells, sometimes we take five cells, up to seven cells from the embryo, and that's what we physically send out for the analysis. Blastocyst embryos still have a risk of mosaicism, meaning that some cells will be normal, some cells may be abnormal. This happens about 20% of the time with a blastocyst embryo, and definitely less risky to the embryo. If we don't feel an embryo is good enough quality to biopsy, we will alert you immediately and ask you what you would like us to do whether you just want to freeze it or you want us to continue to watch it and potentially biopsy it for you should we find that it's okay um, or simply discard it uh, depending on what you would like us to do. This is the process of assist at hatching. So this is done on day three of embryo development. So it's basically creating a small hole in what's called the zona pellucida. So that's the shell that surrounds the egg. So it's a small hole you, uh, made with a laser so we always do it in a spot where it's not touching any of the cells because we don't want to damage the embryo. So it's always in an open space. So just this little tiny hole right here. And then we basically put the embryo back in the uh, incubator and hope it continues to uh, grow and develop. And then this hole gives us an access point in order to do the biopsy process safely. So on day five, day six, day seven in the morning, we always check the embryos and we verify if we have blastocysts for each patient. Then we kind of rate them as to which patient embryo should be biopsied first, second, third, depending on the overall advancement. Once the embryo is biopsied, we will then freeze it and freeze the biopsy sample that we remove from the embryo. So this is the actual biopsy process. So on the other side of the screen, there's a holding pipette holding the blastocyst embryo in position. Uh, this embryo, since we did the hatching, has nicely hatched out of the zona, so it allows us to basically aspirate a few cells from the embryo and then use, again, the laser basically to cut away the cells from the embryo. And that's what we physically send out for the analysis, the little clump of cells that we're removing. Once the biopsy is completed, uh, we put the 
embryo back into the incubator. I, I call it its recovery period. So typically the embryo is allowed to recover for about 30 minutes to an hour before it's subsequently frozen. Uh, basically the embryo and the sample, we give a special ID number that we can match up the results once we get them back from the genetic laboratory. So every embryo is biopsied individually and frozen individually. So it's a very lengthy, time-consuming process. So we do one at a time. People always ask me, how safe is this, this process? You know, with any procedure in the IVF field, unfortunately, there is risk involved. Um, for a biopsy, we say it's about a 3 to 5% risk to the embryo that we could do some form of damage. Um, but at any point in this process, damage can be done with ICSI, with its assisted hatching, freezing, thawing. So there's many different steps in this process that something could go wrong. But we do this process here every day for our patients. So we have a lot of faith in our embryologists that we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. Um, as far as not getting a genetic testing result, we have that happen here less than 2% of the time. And typically that's due to embryo quality or due to the biopsy that was removed from the embryo. Maybe none of the cells removed had any genetic information, so there's nothing to amplify to get a genetic result back. In most of those situations, we have the option of trying to thaw the embryo, biopsy, and refreeze it. Um, most patients choose not to do that just because it is risky, and we may only get the result of it being genetically abnormal. Typically. A lot, most of those embryos that we try to retest are genetically abnormal. So most patients choose not to move forward with that process. As far as the accuracy of NGS, it's around 98%, uh, so extremely high. So as I already explained, once we complete the biopsy process, we load the biopsy sample into a little tube. It's called a PCR tube. We label that with your information as well as an ID number, and we give the ID number with the embryo that's going to be frozen, as well as all your information. Most of the time now, we're simply sending the samples out at the completion of the cycle. We do have patients that want to bank samples over the course of several cycles, so that's why we always confirm with you prior to sending anything out for genetic analysis, because we want to make sure you want to move forward with the testing process. So basically, once we get your confirmation uh, that you would like to move forward with the testing of the embryos, we set up everything for you. We make sure we have all the paperwork in order. We pack the samples, make sure everything is correct arrange for a courier to come pick up the samples, and then they're delivered directly to the laboratory. So there's two different types of laboratories that we use. Um, most of our patients are using Genesis Genetics. There's no difference between the two laboratories, ReproGenetics or Genesis. And they're actually owned by the same company, Cooper Surgical. So no difference whatsoever in the quality of testing. It's just one laboratory offers a one by one pricing and the other offers the batch price. ReproGenetics report has a little bit more information that's displayed. Um, not to say the other one has anything less. Um, they're actually pretty much similar. It's just one just details it out a little bit more, so more visual. This can get a little overwhelming uh, to look at. So basically this report uh, breaks it down by the biopsy results based on the day they were biopsied and their ID number and then the interpretation of the results. So ReproGenetics lists out every single chromosome, 1 through 22, and then the sex chromosome, which is the 23 third pair. What we're hoping to see is twos across the board. So one copy from the mom, one copy from the dad. So the first embryo, or 51225-1, was a genetically normal girl embryo. So that one we would consider viable for embryo transfer. The second embryo is complex abnormal, meaning it showed multiple gains and losses of chromosomes. This embryo we do not recommend for embryo transfer in any situation. There's too many chromosomes missing or uh, not enough information or too much information, so we don't recommend it for transfer. There are situations where there's only one copy of a chromosome, or this embryo here is um, monosomy 21, meaning it's missing a copy of chromosome 21. Typically, um, monosomy embryos won't even implant. Um, trisomy embryos, or this embryo here, trisomy 11, typically can implant, but will usually result in an early-term miscarriage. So that's why we do this testing, so we can weed out all these abnormal embryos so we can focus on transferring simply the normal ones that we have. You know, depending on the patient age, we'll definitely have an impact of how many embryos will come back normal or abnormal. Everyone's different. Everyone's statistics, unfortunately, are different. Um, but depending on age, we can give you kind of a generalized idea of what to expect to come back genetically normal. Again, if we do have a mosaic embryo, it's something to discuss with the doctor if they think it's a viable option for you to transfer it.
So this is Ge Genesis Genetics Report. Again, it lists all your information at the top, and then it just breaks down the results a little simpler. It doesn't have that giant table that lists out the chromosomes. So it's giving you the exact same information, just in a shortened form. So instead of saying uh, normal in, on Genesis Report, it says euploid, which is simply just a scientific term for normal. And it will list 46 means that there's uh, 46 chromosomes. That's considered genetically normal. And XX means a girl, and XY equals boy. So it will just list out uh, what their chromosomal abnormalities are. It kind of spells it out for you. So I find that a little easier for most patients to read. Basically, once we get the genetic results back, um, we do sit, uh, go over it with you. Um, we typically send an email and just ask you what kind of information you would like to be revealed. Obviously, this testing does uh, determine gender. Some people don't want to know that information, so obviously we can exclude that from the report for you if you don't, don't want to know that information. Um, we always respect that and we won't put it on your chart if you don't want to know, so no one will blurt it out to you. At some point, you will find out because we do have to give you a copy of this, these reports to leave our facility with, so when you go in the care of your ob they can see what kind of testing you've already completed. So as far as other prenatal testing, I always tell patients it's very, very beneficial to discuss with your ob what type of testing you've already done, as far as the PGS testing, bring a copy with you so they understand what you've done. You know, the, in all the consent forms, all the paperwork, it says, you know, it may be required to do other prenatal testing because, you know, the testing is not 100%, it's 98%. So it may require you to do other types of testing. So there's uh, non-invasive testing, return at 21, or the Harmony test. It's a blood test that basically screens for chromosomal abnormalities uh, from the fetal blood that's circulating in your circulatory system. Uh, the nuchal scan is an anatomy scan that's done at varying points of development just to ensure that the fetus is growing uh, adequately. Amniocentesis or CVS are usually done you know, for any patient who transfers a genetically abnormal embryo. Um, we definitely tell them 120% you need to do an amniocentesis or a CVS to verify that everything's okay with the, the pregnancy or God forbid something comes up in the nuchal scan or the, the blood test, then it may require further testing to be done and something to discuss with your OBGYN what they think based on your history, what should and should be done. All right, so these are just some frequently asked questions that we get. Um, does embryo stage and grade have any correlation with genetic testing outcome? You know, I don't really think so. Um, obviously, we're hoping that the good quality embryos will come back genetically normal and the not so good looking embryos will come back ab uh, abnormal. But unfortunately, it's a lot of the time we have very average embryos coming back genetically normal. They lead to successful pregnancy and no problems whatsoever. Um, if you have frozen embryos, can you still do the testing? Of course. Um, it just basically requires us to thaw out the embryos, to biopsy them, and subsequently refreeze. Obviously, in that process, we could do some da more damage to the embryo by doing that process, but we do this pretty frequently here. We have a lot of patients that, you know, do a couple cycles with us, then they move forward with transfer. Unfortunately, if transfer fails, and then the doctor says, hey, I think we should test the rest of your embryos to see which one is normal, which one's abnormal, before we move forward with another transfer. Um, can we perform biopsy on any stage embryo? No. The embryo must be a blast cyst in order for us to proceed with the testing. Um, how long does it take to get the results? It depends on the genetic testing lab. Um, for most of our patients, we're getting the results within three to five days. Uh, so as, like I said, as soon as we get the results, we'll relay the information to you.